Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And we're starting a new topic tonight, and I'm, I don't think I've ever been this excited to uh, discuss a subject, uh, because so many times we talk about subjects that are kind of a... Uh, it's, it's, it's easy to get in arguments or get, uh, you know, dispute over what the meaning is, but tonight we're going to start a topic that everybody should be excited and happy to hear about, <laughs> and the subject is heaven. And uh, we're going to be going through a book written by Randy Alcorn. It's titled Heaven. And if you don't have the book, I suggest you buy it. You can actually download it free on the Internet now. And you can pick it up at Walmart or Target now for like three or four dollars. So you should buy this book. But we're going to work our way through the book and and uh, then discuss everything he says. But first, let me introduce uh, uh, Brother Eric, who will be discussing this with me. Eric, you want to say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Brother Eric. Uh, my YouTube channel is Jesus Knight 72 I'm sure if you've seen Brother Luke's other videos, you've seen me there. Uh, looking forward to this topic. It's a great topic, and it's one that Christians should definitely talk a lot more about. Mm-hmm. Amen. Um, let me start off by just saying something that I've thought about. I know that uh, Randy Alcord mentions in, this in his book at some point, but uh, I think this is a good way to kick off this subject, is it? Have you ever heard that saying that uh, people are so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I hear that, you know, I've heard that quite a few times over the years. And what do you think they mean when they say that? Well, I think that. Um... They they think that uh, if their if their attention is too much on something that's beyond us right now that they're not paying attention to the here and now that they don't they don't live in the in the real world that they live with their head in the cloud so to speak. Mm -hmm. And no no earthly good. In other words, they're trying to try trying to again impose what we are uh, you know uh, identifying all the time as a problem in the church, just imposing works on people uh, to. Uh, wor work your way to heaven or prove that you're really a Christian uh, of no earthly good it means hey you're not doing enough work you're not you're not uh, doing enough so um, that is a real common attitude people think that oh don't think about heaven just think about the here and now uh, but from my experience I, I think that cliche should be reversed uh, because I, I think that most people are are thinking about and arguing about the here and now, what we need to do now, and uh, you know how to get everything right now in the church and in our ministries and that, and and even bickering over doctrines and and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they're not thinking about the real goal. Everything that we're doing in this world right now is preparing us for heaven. I, I've actually seen it go to even a further extreme than that, to the point where people have actually said things to the effect of, um, "Well, I hope the rapture doesn't happen too soon because there's things I want to do." <laughs> and I, you know, I, I look and listen to the people say things like that and say, "How could you say something like that? I mean, this is what we're waiting for. This is the greatest thing ever. I mean, this is this is what this is all about." But they actually do. They have they're so goal oriented in what's going on in the world that um, their focus is on that. So I, I'd say I totally agree with your flipping of that that comment. It's, it it's definitely works better the other way around, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, let's start off going through this book. There's a lot of great material in here, so it's gonna, I think this is going to take us uh, – each episode is about two hours long, and to get through all the material in his book, uh, it probably take us a lot of episodes uh, because there's a lot to learn about heaven. And I titled this uh, – your questions answered, I think. Yeah, all your questions answered. Heaven, all your questions answered. Because uh, I think Randy Alcorn in his book really addresses a lot of things that people have wondered about heaven, whether they've verbalized it and asked people, well, what do you think is going to happen? Are, are we going to be eating? Are we going to be married? Are we going to, uh, you know, have bodies? Uh, you know, uh, all kinds. Are we going to just be playing a harp and and uh, and worshiping God all the time? So all these things that people ask about, Randy Elcorn answers all these questions in this book, and he does use uh, scripture to back up his uh, point of view. Yeah, I think it's his big point in his preface is, uh, which was one of the big things that I loved about it. Was the one of the first things he tells people is test this book by scripture, and that's always usually the sign of somebody that's got a fairly good message because they're willing to be tested. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, let me start off by reading this uh, paragraph here. He says, the truth is, in our seminaries, seminaries, churches, and by the way, if you follow along with me, Eric, I'm on the first sure. page of the pre preface. Okay. Uh, uh, in our seminaries, seminaries, churches, and families, we have given amazingly little attention to the place where we will live forever with Christ and his people. The new earth, in the new universe, this eternal heaven is the central subject of this book. It's a subject I found to be fascinating, thrilling, and life-changing. Um, he says, surprising little attention. <laughs> I mean, just think about it. Uh, how many times have you heard uh, pastors teaching about this in their churches? How many videos have you seen on this subject on YouTube? No, it, exactly, and and just in um, just in everyday conversation with other Christians, it's rarely talked about. The certain the issues of the day are talked about. Uh, maybe things we're debating and things of that nature, but seldom do people get into these really in-depth conversations about about the future, what we're looking forward to. Mm -hmm. He also goes on to, to say in his preface that we should test everything by Scripture, and. Uh, I think Randy Alcorn uh, not only was very comprehensive in this book, but he did base all of his opinions and conclusions upon scriptures. So he does back it up with the Word of God. And uh, as we go through this, these points, uh, I think we're going to find most of his conclusions, I think uh, I agree, and it, and it can be uh, uh, proven through the scriptures. And then there's some, some of his conclusions that I'm, I think – well, I'm not necessarily convinced, but it very, may very well be. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's go to uh, the introduction page, and I'm going to read uh, John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, or mansions, in King James. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, uh, that you may also may be where I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this, of course, is Jesus talking about, I guess, I don't know if he prepared the place like in an instant or if he's taking thousands of years to prepare it, but... Uh, are you excited that Jesus is, uh, it, it has either prepared a place or is in the process of preparing a place for you in heaven? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is coming from Jesus himself. And you know something? Nobody can prepare it like Jesus can. So it's like, you know, you, I know we have people who prepare our favorite dishes and, and build things in certain ways here and do art and things of that nature. But the fact is, all of it originally came from the Lord. And nobody nobody can make it like he can. And so if it's taken him thousands of years, well, all the better it's going to be. <laughs> so yeah. it, it can take him a little while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, this mansion that he refers to that he's making for me, uh, I, I I can't wait to see it. And, you know, obviously, uh, I'm not going to do anything to bring about my early demise, <laughs> uh, but I am excited about my, my future and, and, and getting that mansion that he's promised uh, for me and for you, too. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, let's go to page, uh, I guess in the intro, uh, page XX20, and um, the middle paragraph it says, These early Christian perspectives sound almost foreign today, don't they? Well, let me back up. I, I didn't see what those perspectives were. The page before it says, uh, Early Christians' preoccupation with heaven, the Roman catacombs where the bodies of many martyred Christians were buried contained tombs with inscriptions such as these. Uh, in Christ, Alexander is not dead, but he but lives. Uh, one who lives with God, he was taken up into his eternal home. So Randy's making the point that uh, in the early church they did seem to have a preoccupation with heaven, the afterlife, our eternal our eternal existence. And uh, we said earlier that it doesn't seem like we see that much in, in the church today. No. No, I think the focus focus is a lot more on negative things. 
Okay, now we go to that paragraph on the next page. It says, these early Christian perspectives sound almost foreign today, don't they? But their beliefs were rooted in scriptures where the Apostle Paul writes, quote, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is uh, better by far, Philippians 1, 21 and 23. Uh, he also wrote, quote, as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. But we, we would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8. Um, I know that's how I feel. And uh, I've felt that even more as I've gotten older. You know, I, I've dealt with uh, you know, various health problems. I've dealt with, you know, the different trials of life, and uh, uh, I know that even any time you even get things right, you know, you got, it seems like you got your problem solved. Well, brace yourself; another problem is going to hit you. So, in this in this world, even though we've got a lot to be thankful for, and uh, we are very very blessed, we continue to have problems, and and then as we age. Our body wears out, and and then I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten even more anxious for this time where I could be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Do you think absolutely? About that? Oh, absolutely. There's a there's a, a beautiful song that I really like uh, out there. It's called Blessings. Um, I think it's by Laura Starkey. I think is the girl's name. I could be wrong about that, but um, I love that song. It makes me choke up every time I hear it because she's talking kind of about that. It's like it's like sometimes the blessings that we see, you know, um, are the sometimes the tough things we go through, which remind us that you know this place is not what we're in store for. This is not what why we're here. That it's it's something that shows us there's a greater thing that we should be striving for, a greater thing that we should desire, which this world can't provide for us. And and that's really what what God is, you know, what, what Christ is saying, what Paul's saying, these things. You know, to be here to work for Christ is absolutely good. Do we want to do that? Absolutely. But there's nothing wrong with us as Christians saying, my greater desire is to be home. My, my greater desire, I'm an ambassador, I'm here for a time, but my greater desire is to go back to my home country, to go back to my place where I belong, because that's where my heart is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, you know, talking between ourselves, and, and, and anybody who watches this video who uh, understands what we're saying uh, can identify with this, but, but many of the people I've talked to in my life about this kind of a thing, they think I'm crazy. They think, how are you... Uh, you you would rather be dead. <laughs> you know they don't. They can't. You know, you know it's so funny you say that. I work with the man. It's so funny. I got to stop you there because I work with the guy. His one of his favorite sayings is, "Oh, I'm going to live to be 150." And, I, and the one time I told him, I said, "I said, why would I want to be live to be 150? I don't want to live to be that old. I can't think of anything more monotonous. I don't, I don't want to keep doing this for another." You know, I said, "I, I want to go where I'm not sick anymore, where I don't have to see uh, uh, people die, where I don't have to see people suffer, where I don't have to suffer myself, where where those things never happen anymore. You know, that's what I long for. So a long life is, you know, and and you're right. I get the same reaction. People look at me like I'm crazy. They say, "You don't want to live a long life." I'm like, "No, nah, not really." Not particularly. <laughs> I said I'd much rather go home. And they say that's just crazy. I said, well, no. But if you if you understood what I understand, if you believed what I believed, and you and you knew what I knew, then you'd understand. You, you'd be able to see where I'm coming from. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, uh, a normal way of greeting someone is they say, well, how are you? How are you doing today? And I always say either one of two things. I say I'm fantastic. Uh, or I say I'm 9.5 on a scale of 1 to 10, and uh, if people hear that, that after a while they, they say, well, why are you always so fantastic? Why are you uh, 9.5? Why aren't you 10? And I said, well, I can't be 10 out of 10 until I leave this body and go to heaven. When I'm in heaven, that's 10. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I tell you what, but it is it is something good. Um, you know, Christians, too many Christians today, and I know because I'm one of them sometimes, you know, I let my and, and that you know, maybe that's also that focus on heaven. You know, when you become so focused, it's like it's like Peter getting out of the boat. You know, you lose that sight of Christ. Well, where is Christ? Christ is in heaven. 
he's he's going to come back for us okay well so our sights should be fixed on that okay we take our sight away from that and the world and the things around us drag us down and as a result you see a lot of christians today you see them down and they they shouldn't be the ones who look defeated they shouldn't be the ones who walk around moping and and down even if they're and, and please understand for those people watching i know you're going through things I, I know you're going through trials in your life. I know I'm going through them myself. Trust me, I'm going through some of the biggest trials I've ever been through in my life right now. But you know what? It, it never changes the fact that God's with you all the time. He's walking with you. He has a plan for you. And eventually all these things are going are gonna to be completed in that joyous day where you're with him, in that place where you desire to be. And that's what should make the Christians walk. You know, you, you, you convicted me a little bit today when we did that or, or when we met today and you said that very thing to me. I said, oh, I'm okay. You know, no, you know, you're right. We, we should be saying, hey, I got so much wonderful things I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I'm 9 out of 10. Until I get there, then I'll be 10. <laughs> I agree. I think you're right. Uh, another thing that I've noticed, uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but I've heard this numerous times where I say, how are you today to someone? And they say, well, I'm above ground. <laughs> and I say, I say, well, that, well, why are you so happy about that? Person, personally, I'd rather be dead. <laughs> You'd rather be dead? And I said, yeah, because when I'm, when I'm dead, I leave this body behind, I'll be with the Lord in heaven. Absolutely. Know? Oh, they look, they think you're nuts. They really yeah. do. It's funny. Well, we are we are nuts in the eyes <laughs> of the world. And, Absolutely. Uh, even among many, many Christians, uh, there are actually a lot of Christians do do not embrace uh, this great desire to to be with the Lord, and uh, uh, well, I think you made one of the comments I want. I think you made earlier kind of keyed on that when you when you made the comment about saying you know you're so uh, uh, heavenly minded that you know earthly good. Well, you know the Bible says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And if you don't know what enmity is, you should look that up. People should look it up. Okay. Um, our goal is not to be comfortable in this world or fr or, or uh, seek the um, approval of this world or to seek our joy in this world. That's not our objective. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. I'm going to read another paragraph. Let me see. What? Okay. Um, so he says, in my father's house, oh, Looks like Jackson's here. There he is. Uh huh. Hey Jackson. Jackson. Hey there. I, I'm glad you I, could join us. You got my message, huh? No, I. I well, I, I. I saw that you left a message on my phone, but I dedu deduced what it was about. Then I realized it was Wednesday, and I'm like, well, I'm not really doing anything else, so I figured I'd come in a little bit late. But apparently, this was um, this was not Bible talk with Brother Luke until I got here. It was Bible duel. With Brother Luke. <laughs> uh, Eric versus Lou. Well, let me first first let me say, Jackson, we love that you joined us, but Eric and I were doing quite well, just for the two of us, very well. Oh, I didn't say it was a bad thing. Yeah, and you know what? You know what, brother? We're, we are talking about heaven, and I, the message I left you, I thought it would be very compelling because I left this message on your phone. I said you've got to join this uh, topic. We're talking about heaven, and if you don't join us, then you're not going to go to heaven. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> Was that a hidden salvation condition? Yeah. <laughs> Is that what we're studying? The hidden salvation condition. <laughs> you got to you got to check the fine print, Jackson. <laughs> uh, well, Jackson, uh, uh, the last uh, hangout, uh, I told everybody that we are going to be doing this series on heaven. It's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, if an episode is t is two hours long, this would probably take us you know, 10 episodes or maybe 20 episodes. It's going to take a long time to get through this because we're going to go through this book by Randy Alcorn called Heaven. Okay. And you can pick up this book at Walmart or Target now for like 3 or $4, and okay. Austin found it. Uh, you can actually look, download like a PDF file or something free okay. on the Internet. Yeah. So whichever way you want to get it would be good. But we're, we're just basically reading different parts of this and then discussing it. And uh, okay. Before so, I got here, what part were you discussing then? Uh, we're talking about absent from the body, uh, present with the Lord, and to, to live as Christ but to die as gain, and the idea that so few people are excited about going to heaven, and, and, and no pa pastors aren't talking about it, YouTubers aren't talking about it, and uh, it's just uh, it's disappointing that people are uh, not excited about their future in heaven. Well, interestingly, this is exactly was the this was the topic just a week ago, 
in this class I'm taking right now. I'm taking this class on life skills, and the guy did this thing about death and everything, and, you know, death, and I, was, I just thought to myself, you know, this lecture is probably depressing a lot of other people, but it actually kind of makes me excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, I've said that, um, uh, I've asked people sometimes, how are they doing, and they say, well, I'm, a, I'm above ground, like, that's a good thing, and I said, I, they said, well, how are you doing, and I said, well, uh, personally, I'd rather be dead. What? Yeah. You'd rather be dead, yeah, because when I leave this body, I'll be with the Lord in heaven. So, um, uh, okay, I'm going to pick up where we left off, and there's a lot to cover. Just, um, um, yeah, because I, I did get here kind of early in the show, right? Like, oh, um, yeah, 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 we're still a long ways to go. Um, so uh, we're reading from Aunt Randy Alcorn's book. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. He's going to prepare a place for us. Um and then he says, this place is not an ethereal realm of disembodied spirits because human beings are not suited for such a realm. A place is by nature physical, just as human beings are by nature physical. We are also spiritual, but what, what we are suited for what we've been specifically designed for is a place like the one God made for us, Earth. So, uh, what do you think the world's uh, impression of is of heaven is, is some ethereal realm where you're some spirit being, and uh, you know playing a harp or something? And uh, well, uh, my. My grandfather grew up thinking it was going to be just a boring place with a bunch of gold streets and people playing harps. But hey, at least it's better than burning, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, and well, you know, and that's not uncommon, and that's one of the problems because people see it as something boring. There are actually Christians out there, and Randy talks about this in the book that he's talked to, and that I know I've talked to some people who allude to. I can't imagine a more boring, tedious life than you know just sitting on clouds playing harps and and, and I would tell them say, "Wow, you really have no idea what heaven is really like." <laughs> you have no, well, I'd say you know I'd feel that way too if that was really what it is, but it's not. Yeah, well, you know we've all read the the Bible all the way through, and uh, uh, it's amazing how many Christians have never really read it from really from cover to cover. Uh, I've read it through many times, and, and then I've gone back and studied it thoroughly. Uh, and uh, what the average Christian is not aware of is that um, we are going to have physical bodies in a physical place, and it will be Earth. We're going to discuss this in much more great detail, but we're not going to be some spirit beings off in some other dimension or some other place out in space. That uh, will there be uh, the way I what I've always heard growing up, which doesn't make it right, is that like we'll be able to switch from our spirit bodies to our physical bodies in the new heaven and the new earth. I have no idea whether that's biblical or not, but that's just the impression I was raised with. Well, I guess. well, I think I think there's there's and we'll probably may talk about this down the road. I'm not sure if the book goes there or not, but um, there's really if if you if you look at when when Jesus is resurrected, I mean some of the point of showing um us our his resurrected body was uh a a um a a type of if you will what we will receive when we receive resurrected bodies. You don't need to slip out of your body or to do those things because the raptured, the perfected, immortal body that you'll receive will be capable of doing great things that a physical body can't do. So you, there won't be a need to slip in and out of a physical body or something of that nature because that body is designed to do certain things that are beyond our comprehension at this point. Interesting. Yeah. Now Jackson, uh, this book that we're uh, working our way through is very comprehensive, and I titled this video, uh, this series, Heaven, All Your Questions Answered, because I think that Randy Alcorn was so thorough, uh, taking a lot of questions uh, like the one you just brought up, and there's many, many more, and he uh, attempts to answer them, but he uses scripture to back up his, uh, his supposition. Cool. And so as we go through this, you're going to... Um, probably learn a lot and and you may agree I think you'll probably agree with most of his conclusions maybe not everything um, 
Oh no, we have to we have to completely disregard everything he says if we don't agree with every tiny thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's burn the book. Th throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know. If you, we find one error in it from him at all, <laughs> even if it's a spelling error, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even if it's I accidentally spilled coffee on the book, that, that's his fault. Yes. Now, for the viewers who are not aware of this, this is uh, Jackson's uh, use of humor to make the point that we d deal with a lot of people who are very dogmatic and that uh, if, if, if you get in conversations with them, and even though you may agree on a lot of things, as soon as they find any little point of disagreement, all of a sudden they want to shun you and... and uh, uh, <laughs> and label you. <laughs> so, uh, no, uh, we don't necessarily will agree with every one of Randy Alcorn's conclusions. Uh, you know, I've read the book completely already. Uh, I remember when I read this book years ago, it basically made me happier than I've ever been in my life because I understood so much of what I have to look forward to. And uh, so I'm really, you know, grateful that we can all go through this together again. <laughs> We're going to go into chapter one now, the, uh, the heading that says, Are you looking forward to heaven? This is J.C. Ryle being quoted. The man who is about to sail for Australia or New Zealand as a settler is naturally anxious to know something about his future home, its climate, its employments, its inhabitants, its ways, its customs. All these are subjects of deep interest to him. You are leaving the land of your nativity, you are going to spend the rest of your life in a new hemisphere. Uh, it would be strange indeed if you did not desire information about your new abode. Now surely, if we hope to dwell forever in that, quote, better country, even a heavenly one, unquote, we ought to seek all the knowledge we can get about it. Before we go to our eternal home, we should try to become acquainted with it. So, as we go through this, I'd like just to get your reaction to everything we're reading here. Uh, uh, personally, I have a great interest, and I have had a lot of my questions answered from reading this book before, because reading through the scriptures, even though I've gone through the Bible numerous times, um, I, some of it I didn't connect the dots and realize uh, every, all the things that, that we're going to learn from going through this book here. So, there's a lot to learn about. Our, our eternal um, destiny, and uh, it's exciting to know that. So how do you feel about that? Jackson, you, guys, you wanna? Oh, oh, me? Okay. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Um. All right. I think it makes sense. It makes sense to know where you're going. Obviously, I, I've always thought some of heaven's appeal is not knowing exactly. Like maybe not all about it because there's a, there's kind of a mystery that's very intriguing. Now, like if I just spoiled what happens in the latest Hunger Games movie, which I recommend you see if you really haven't, then it ruins part of the movie. You know? But maybe maybe not like like maybe maybe because I think there's even one passage where Paul says he's talking about some blessing, then he says, "But I can't talk about that right now" or something. Like that. <laughs> and again. Yeah. Having a good idea that it is a good place is one thing. For example, it's kind of like I have an accurate, an accurate idea that it is a good and wonderful place to be excited about and be able to know that because if not, like it's like, oh, that this could be a, gr a good movie, but it could be a horrible movie that I'm very disappointed with or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, so that's sort of how I think about it. Maybe there's a balance there, if that makes any sort of sense. Sure. I, I think one of the things about the quote, um, and following along the lines what Jackson was saying, you know, which is a great co a quote by the way, um, it's so commonsensical. It, it's so I mean, you, for instance, you're going to go to New Zealand. You've never been there before, but you're about to go to New Zealand. You know, New Zealand is going to be a place you've never seen before. You've never been there. You don't know quite what to expect, but you know when you go there, there's going to be mountains, and there's going to be trees, and there's going to be water, and there's going to be people, and there's going to be things like that. So right. you, you realize 
as a basis from where you are now, you know there are some things that are going to be familiar to you. While it's a completely alien place to you, you've never been there before, you know what to expect, some things. And I think that is God's intention be behind our experiences now in life. And I think that we're going to see that as we go through the book, again. we're going to see that a little bit more. But it doesn't really make much common sense for God to design a place that is so detailed, so complex as the creation that we know it, um, to then to send you from that place to something you're completely unfamiliar with, with no idea how to act or what to expect. It just doesn't really make sense. I mean, how would you truly enjoy it if you couldn't enjoy an even better version of what you're used to? I, I think it makes the enjoyment more enjoyable. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's all true, uh, but I'm still kind of blown back by Jackson's comment. <laughs> uh, Jackson, you know, your brain and my brain don't work alike. And, You're neurotypical. Yeah, that's, and, and this is one of the reasons I always look forward to talking with you, because you come up with some things and perspectives, like Brother Mitch, you guys come up with something that just never would dawn on me. But but you know what? It, it, it's a very interesting point too. The the idea of the suspense, the intrigue of wondering and not knowing necessarily, and then of course there's the desire to know too. I I, I want to know, and I think this book will answer a lot of our questions. But yet, no matter how uh, much we think we understand it, we are going to be blown away. It's, oh, absolutely. It's just going to be it's just going to be just like beyond anything. Um, you know, we can imagine it, and we can get a good idea, but our imaginations, our exp greatest expectations, I don't think can ever reach a level of what I believe is, we're going to have. Okay, it says uh, about uh, Puritan Jonathan Edwards, it says, in his early 20s, Edwards composed a set of life resolutions. One read, resolved to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world as I possibly can. Yeah, the other world. So here he's, uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards is thinking about the purpose of what he's doing right now is to so that he can maximize his happiness in heaven. Uh, what could he be referring to there? Well, clearly he's referring to his rewards. He's saying he's doing as, as much as possible he can here on earth so that he can uh, have all these things that the Lord talk about, these great rewards in heaven that he can only imagine, begin to partially imagine what might be waiting for him. So he's building he's building on those rewards, like Jesus said, to you know, uh, uh, heap up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So that's what he's doing. Well, to agree with Eric there, it's actually, in my opinion, a very politically incorrect point here. And the reason I say that is because, believe it or not, with some people I know who claim to be Christians, and maybe I'm going over the gospel about faith alone, faith, going to heaven even if you live disobediently, etc., they'll ask me, well, why should I do anything? And I'll talk, whenever I bring up rewards or anything, they get so offended at the idea that some people have more rewards in heaven than other people do, or that there's that there's some that it will be even more enjoyable for some people. I mean, I they seriously get offended. It's not just they think, hmm, I haven't thought of that before. They seriously think they're like, what? Yeah. Now I know that uh, uh, at a future point in the book, not too far from now, we're we're going to go over this uh, what a person must do in order so that they can go to heaven. Uh, but the, the, for now, let's just say that the world as a whole thinks that the way they go to heaven is by working and earning it, and, and the reward for, for living a good life, the reward is heaven. But we know uh, from being Christians and studying the scriptures that he heaven is not the reward. The, uh, heaven is the gift. Eternal life in heaven is the gift we receive because we put our faith in our Savior Jesus Christ he gives us eternal life in the kingdom of God uh, and so it's a free gift the rewards uh, that we get in heaven are, are, are based upon how well we served the Lord and what we what we did after we put our faith in him what did you do at from that point on to your last breath 
that's how you're building up your treasures in heaven and getting those rewards. So, no, uh, heaven would not be communistic where everybody has an equal share of everything. But personally, uh, if I was the poorest person in heaven, I'd still be jumping for joy. I don't even think just personally. I don't think anyone's going to be have any disappointment in the slightest. Uh, yeah, for fo following both of those mindsets, yeah, I, I, I know there are going to be people going into heaven who are going to have far more than I'm going to have, and I have absolutely no problem with that. <laughs> Me too. Uh, here, here's an interesting uh, quote from uh, just a, an anonymous pastor. He says, a pastor once confessed to me, quote, whenever I think about heaven, it makes me depressed. I, I'd rather just cease to exist when I die. He asked, um, Randy Alcorn asked the pastor why, and the pastor replied, I can't stand the thought of that endless tedium to float around in the clouds with nothing to do but strum a harp. It's all so terribly boring. Heaven doesn't sound much better than hell. I'd rather be annihilated than spend eternity in a place like that. <laughs> this, this guy's a pastor. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. I mean, I mean for Pete's sake, <laughs> this guy's a pastor. Yeah, this, this guy sounds like, like one of my fellow students, not like a pastor. <laughs> it's just mind-blowing. I remember when I read that the first time when I read that in the book, and I'm sitting here thinking, I, I had to stop reading for a while, just contemplate that for a while. I was like, this that's man, the state I'm in right now. It, you know, this man is, is in front of who, who knows how many people. <laughs> you know what? It just goes to show... It just goes to show what ignorance there is surrounding heaven, that a pastor would say that. Mm -hmm. That's what it just goes to show. Yeah, It's just scary that to, just to have a man who, who's supposed to be a, a church leader um, know so little about the objective. I mean, it, it's, that's sad. Yeah, see, if he was right, which of course we're going to very quickly here see that he's not, but if he was right and... Luke is right, but annihilation. Then the best option would be to not be saved. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If that was the case, I would agree. Just <laughs> annihilate me too. Who wants to be like bored for eternity? But uh, as we go through this book, we're going to find out that throughout the scriptures, we learn that it's not going to be boring. It's not going to be some ethereal existence on a cloud, just playing a harp and and uh, bored to death. Uh, it's going to be exciting and thrilling and educational and just pleasure. It's like the way I always describe it is uh, I remember street preaching telling people, I said, look, uh, um, the, the, imagine the best experience you had in your whole life, the most joyful experiences you've ever had, and imagine that that will be like, uh, the lowest point in heaven. Heaven is going to be like, that will be the lowest point. Your joys in, on earth uh, are, are going to be so much greater. Um, like, my happiest moments will be like this, compared to the saddest moments of heaven, or in contrast. And, and whereas the... Uh, so, yeah, but I think that the, the, uh, the clergy, uh, the Christians as a whole, and the world as a whole, they are not excited about this afterlife, our future, uh, as, um, as we're going to be when we finish this book, because the, the, there's so much ignorance about this subject. It's, it, an understanding heaven in eternity uh, is the church is wildly ignorant. Okay, um, let me read this next paragraph here uh, down uh, near the bottom of the page. It says, I agree with this statement by John Eldridge in The Journey of Desire. Quote, nearly every Christian I have spoken with has some idea that eternity is an unending church service. We have settled on an image of the never-ending sing-along in the sky, one great hymn after another, forever and ever, amen. Yeah, uh, there's been uh, so so little written about heaven. This book here is comprehensive, but it's hard to find books on it, and it's hard hard to find sermons on it. So people are just absolutely ignorant about their future, and this is the kind of and the wonder people say that uh, they want to live as long as they can. They're not anxious to leave this world behind, go to the next. 
You know, there's an interesting verse I just looked up. I, it, you, you were talking about, you know, what you were talking about before, and this is something I've mentioned to my son as far as you, you mentioned, you know, imagine something good in your life and it will just so pale in comparison. It's like all these pastors, these teachers, these people who have this idea have forgotten what's in Isaiah and in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, where it's written, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Th th think of the most amazing thing you've ever seen on this planet or in space or whatever. Think of the most amazing things you've ever seen. You have not seen or touched on what God has prepared for you. It, it, that's a really humbling thought. I mean, it's it's something that should get you excited. It should get give you chills. It should give <laughs> – I mean, you, you, there's nothing amazing that you've seen that will not be bested. In heaven, I mean, it, it's it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the greatest feeling you've ever had, uh, heaven will be like that on a million steroids. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's a great, great analogy. It's good. Yeah, you know what, what's very interesting about that is if I, as I think past on my life and think about when the time, when I'm talking about the top of the top, I could point to a lot of things that were very happy and very exciting. And interestingly, I think the very, very best one is a few really, really good dreams that I had at one point. And I've always pictured heaven to be kind of somewhat like that. Hmm. Well, did you actually have dreams of heaven or just a dream that was just very pleasurable? Uh, to both. I've had both in the past, over the years. Hmm. Well, I often pray at night when I go to bed, Lord, give me a dream of heaven or a vision of heaven or something. I just, I really, really want to see it. I, mean, I know, I know I'm going to see it, uh, but I want to see it even sooner if possible. Uh, okay, let's go. We're going to go to page eight. Uh, in the middle of the page, it said uh, theological neglect of heaven. Uh, John Calvin, the great expositor, never wrote a commentary on Revelation and never dealt with the eternal state at any length. Though he encourages uh, meditation on heaven in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, his theology of heaven seems strikingly weak compared to theology of God, Christ, salvation, scripture, and the church. This is understandable in light of the pressing theological issues of his day, but surprisingly, Few theologians in the centuries since Calvin have attempted to fill in the gaps. A great deal has been written about eschatology, the study of the end times, but comparatively little about heaven. Only a small number of books on heaven uh, I've collected are still in print. Does that surprise you guys? It, it does. It does from somebody from people who are who demonstrate that they that they're they have such a, sto a a solid opinion of theology because really what is what does it say about their opinion of god you know in a way isn't it saying that by you know by not concentrating on heaven or like the other pastor said that heaven is would be boring i mean aren't you kind of saying that god is by his nature a boring god or a god who is uninteresting i mean do you see what i'm saying i mean in a way aren't isn't that kind of isn't that kind of a tell it's you're you're kind of saying this is really what i kind of think at hardy he's kind of a boring guy not a very interesting guy and i can't see how someone could think that um a god who created this universe uh, the complexities of this universe, even when you come down to the smallest things, cells, atoms, molecules, how they can consider that being to be anything more than, uh, so much more than interesting. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible. I mean... Well, in light of, it does, it, but my answer to does it surprise me is yes and no. It does surprise me in, in a sense, but it doesn't surprise me in light of what I know right now about people and how they think about the afterlife and statements like the one we read in this book already about the pastor making that statement. You know, it seems like there's a very, um, there, there's a very uh, strong inclination amongst people to look on the negative side, on the half, glass is half empty point of view. So I hear way more about hell than I do heaven and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. So in light of knowing that, I would say it doesn't surprise me that most of the books on it are out of print. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, he, he cites a couple of more examples uh, in addition to, to Calvin. He says, theologian Reinhold Niebuhr wrote an in-depth two-volume set titled The Nature and Destiny of Man. Remarkably, he had nothing to say about heaven. <laughs> William Shedd's three-volume <coughs> uh, dogmatic theology contains 87 pages on eternal punishment but only two on heaven. In his 900-page theology, Great Doctrines of the Bible, Martin Lloyd-Jones devotes less than two pages to the eternal state and the new earth. Louis Burkhoff's classic systematic theology devotes 38 pages to creation, 40 pages to baptism and communion, and 15 pages to the intermediate state. Yet it contains only two pages on hell and one page on the eternal state. So, I mean, uh, he's given numerous examples. Uh, uh, and again, it just, it, this just reinforces my uh, ex own experience that I just don't hear sermons on heaven. You know, yeah, Jackson... Jackson said something. I'm sorry, Jackson. I'll let you finish in a second. No I problem. just want to say, Jackson said something very interesting. And based on what you just read about these other things, and this kind of just popped into my head, you almost, it's almost like it's a guilt thing. Do, do, do they think that, that because we're supposed to be sharing the gospel, our concern is supposed to be for our fellow man, and we want to try and bring the gospel to them so that they know the love of Christ, they trust in Christ as their Savior, and go to heaven, that, they, that these guys think somehow it's wrong dedicating so much time to heaven when they should really be concentrating on uh, uh, the people who are going to hell? I mean, is, is it, do, they, do they have this feeling that you know, maybe we shouldn't spend time on that because it's more important to spend time on, on always talking about that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think this. Uh, I was pretty much just going to reiterate that, by the way, Eric. So it was interesting. I, well, I think you can't help but come to that conclusion based on where you started, and then what Luke's reading here. You see what they're dedicating their times toward. Well, yeah, uh, and, and uh, I've told <laughs> I've told this Bible study before about the guy I knew who was he graduated, but he was very active within a ministry on campus here, and I I knew him pretty well. And he basically said, you know, I'm a disciple, I'm a follower of Christ, but I don't really think or care much about the afterlife. Even if I was a disciple and went to hell, fine. That really was his ad. He really said that, believe it or not. And it was like, he was, I was like, well, aren't you excited? I remember I said something very similar to, Are, aren't you excited about going to heaven at least or something like that? He's like, I don't care if there's gold-plated toilets, was what he said. <laughs> <laughs> That was what he said, though. That just shows I believe you. <laughs> a mass misconception here. Just like there's, we've already on the show many times talked about the mass misconception on salvation and everything. I think there's also mass misconception on what is heaven like, you know. Oh, absolutely. I and really, that. all this, all of this boils down to what does the Bible teach? And the problem is people base it on what people say the Bible teaches rather than actually reading it for themselves and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as we go through this book, uh, Randy Elkhorn's book titled Heaven, uh, he's, he, the points that he makes, the, the, uh, the, the propositions he's putting forth about heaven, it's all backed up by scripture. So these are not just some one man's theories, they're, they're scriptural uh, conclusions. Uh, but I think what we've uncovered here so far reinforces what I said in the very beginning. Uh, Eric, when I started the whole thing, I said, there's a saying that, uh, uh, people are, are some people are so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good, but that hasn't been my experience. It's my experience is the exact opposite. They're so earthly minded that they don't they don't have the joy of looking forward to heaven at all because they're just thinking about the here and now, and they don't understand heaven. Otherwise, they'd be thrilled and joyful every moment, every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, uh, on page 10, in the middle it says, uh, we're, we're told how to get to heaven, and that it's a better destination than hell, but we're, we're taught remarkably little about heaven. And page 11 says, Satan need not convince us that heaven doesn't exist. He need only convince us that heaven is a place of boring, unearthly existence. <laughs> 
<laughs> if we believe that that lie will be robbed of our joy and anticipation, we'll set our minds on this life and not the next, and we won't be motivated to share our faith. Why should we share the good news that people can spend eternity in a boring, ghostly place that even we're not looking forward to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that and that is so his modus operandi. That's how he works. I mean, with everything, he's like, oh yeah, you can you can believe in uh, in uh, in heaven, sure, but just it's it's not really what you think it is. Or you know, it's the same thing. It's like he has no problem people who believe in God. He'd much rather you didn't believe in the devil because you know if there's no devil, there's no fall. You know, <laughs> if there's no fall, there's no need for redemption because you don't really have sin. You don't need to be redeemed. So he would he'd much rather give you that you know ocean of truth and a cup of poison. So he so he tells you. You know, oh yeah, sure. There's a heaven. There's a heaven. It's just really boring. So you know, and that that's that's so how he acts, how how he works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I know we talked earlier about uh, you know how we're excited about uh, leaving this body and going on to be with our Savior Jesus and into eternity and to the heaven and oh, it's it's we're excited about that. We're anxious for it and. and uh, and, and the the average person, if you were to talk like that, they think you're you're weird and crazy. Why do you? That's very depressing. You you actually are looking forward to dying. <laughs> okay, uh, we're moving to chapter two, and the title is "Is Heaven Beyond Our Imagination?" And there's a quote by Alistair McGrath: um, "To speak of imagining heaven." does not imply or entail that heaven is a fictional notion constructed by deliberately disregarding the harsher realities of the Earth Day world. It is to affirm the critical role of the God-given human capacity to construct and enter into mental pictures of divine reality, which are met mediated through scripture and the subsequent tradition of reflection and development. We are able to inhabit the mental images we create and thence uh, anticipate the delight of finally entering the greater reality to which they correspond. <laughs> As I was reading that, Jackson, I was thinking of Jack Smack because of just the way that it was worded with the vocabulary. It's like, come yeah. on, that's not, my, that's not everyday language I can relate to here. <laughs> But uh, the idea is, uh, uh, can we really imagine what heaven is like? Uh, and uh, we don't, we don't really have to imagine that much because we're going to find as we go through the scriptures that uh, uh, a lot of the questions and things that we wonder about are, are are answered in the scriptures if we take the time to really look for the answers. Let's go to page 16 at the bottom. It says. Nearly every notion of heaven I present in this book was stimulated and reinforced by biblical texts. Though some of my interpretations and speculations are no doubt mistaken, they are not baseless. In other words, he's basing all of his conclusions on scripture. Scripture is uh, cited to uh, uh, on each one of his conclusions, but he is admitting that he may be wrong in some of his conclusions, but at least there's scripture that he's citing. So, uh, what do you think about that? I mean, I, I, is, is you you know that there's plenty of people we encounter that they are coming with all up with all kinds of theories about all kinds of uh, subjects in theology, and they're getting their making their conclusions or uh, uh, presenting their ideas, and the ideas did not come from scripture. They came from me maybe. What they think is the Holy Spirit revealing something to them, or maybe or just near death experience things too. Yeah. I yeah. really, uh, I, 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 I all but just throw those in the, uh, throw those away and disregard them whenever somebody claims that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the near death experiences. Uh you, I mean, you've come across those, haven't you, before? The yeah, I, I think I've. I think I made a video. Someone asked me about that in Q and A, and uh, I have a video on that. It's. Uh, I think that the near death experiences. Uh, they certainly are not death experiences because death. You don't return to death. <laughs> you know, so it, it's just a near death thing, and uh, who knows if it's just some kind of a. Uh, 
uh, imaginings uh, as uh, as they're dying, or if it's some kind of like a chemistry going on in their brain, or if it's it some kind of demonic too. Yeah, I was going to say, some or these, if it's some kind of demonic delusion, because yeah, because nothing, here's the thing: some of these people who do it preach false gospels and everything. Some of these people mm -hmm. who have near death experiences. Yeah. Well, I think that goes along with what the point that uh, Randy just made in the book is that his conclusions are based upon scripture. And this is where we, we test everything by the scripture. So if someone told me they have some near-death experience, uh, and they, as they explained it to me, I would be thinking, does this agree with what scripture says? If it doesn't, then I have to discard it and say it's just their imagination or, or, it's, just, uh, or it's demonic uh, influence to try to deceive the world. Uh, and on page uh, 17, it says, Picturing Heaven. By the time you, find, you finish reading this book, you will have a biblical basis for envisioning the eternal heaven. You will understand that in order to get a picture of heaven, uh, which, one day, uh, which, will, which will one day be centered on the new earth, you don't need to look up at the clouds. You simply need to look around you and imagine what all this would be like without sin and death and suffering and corruption. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to surprise a lot of the people watching this video who are not aware of that. And we'll, we'll go into this in much more detail as we go along through the book, but uh, our eternal state uh, is not off in space somewhere or in a different dimension. It's right here on Earth, except it's going to be a new Earth, created like this Earth, but, but it'll be a new creation uh, with per this perfect, without sin, death, uh, corruption, uh, just perfection. Mm-hmm. So um, now if we go to page 18, uh, at the bottom it quotes this verse we've referred to. It says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. And then it says, But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. Uh, the context makes it clear that this revelation is God's word, uh, so, some people will take this verse and, and, and say that uh, we can't even imagine what heaven will be like. Well, you couldn't imagine uh, on loan uh, on, by, without the scriptures. But, the, but by reading the scriptures, we can imagine or understand uh, what heaven will be like because the scriptures speak of it. Mm -hmm. And in page 20, it says, setting our hearts and minds on heaven... It says, quote, uh, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, Colossians 3.1. This is a direct command to set our hearts on heaven and to make sure we don't miss the importance of a heaven-centered heaven life. The next verse says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. God commands us to set our hearts and minds on heaven. Now that's a... That's a very neglected doctrine right there, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's neglected in two ways, I think, actually. I mean, there's the obvious way about, you know, caring about the cares of the world and everything. But interestingly, it also seems to be neglected um, even within the Christian world, it seems like, when they say, oh, yeah, Jesus is going to give you a great life, giving your life to Christ, blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's really all about the earthly life, if you if you listen to them and everything, and how much they enjoy their now earthly life and everything. Right, because they're right exactly the prosperity gospel where they're justifying yeah, their exactly. prosperity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, th I think from two sides of the coin, if that makes sense. Absolutely, no, that makes perfect sense. And and you know, in light of what you talked about previously in this, and and what we're talking about here, you know, um, God in creating us as you know, as as what we are, he made us to be imaginative beings. He gave us imagination. Um, God is a very imaginative being in and of himself. Look look at the various things he's created. Look at look at look at the the, the you know the, all the diversity in creation. Um, even from one mountain to another, uh, one tree to another. One. Um, so when Christ gives us a command here as we read in Colossians when Christ gives us the command you know uh, heap up for yourselves treasures in heaven we're being directed to think about that I mean don't you think that he knows as human beings we are going to imagine 
what that would be like. So we're not directed to, to, to in any way by Christ to, to, to well, hold your imagination. Don't think about it too much because, you know, I, I don't want you to think about something that's not the way it really is. I mean, he doesn't tell us that. He wants us to be excited about that, which is why he tells us to, to think and these verses tell us to be, you know, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Um, that's the whole point. There's nothing wrong with it being imaginative about that and imagining what that's going to be like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it says, diligently, actively, single-mindedly pursue the things above heaven. And uh, so Randy says, now you have a clear biblical reason for reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. It is. I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, I, I can still recall very, very, very clearly probably the two happiest times of my whole life. But first was when I finished reading a commentary by Dr. Peter Ruckman on the book of Revelation. And I, much of it is about heaven and eternity. And I was so excited about heaven in my future. And then reading this book here, uh, the same experience I had. When I, when I read this book, uh, it, it just made me just happy and excited. And I'm glad that we're going through it again because it's just going to refresh my memories of what I have to look forward to. So if someone is uh, watching this video, uh, as we go through this and you learn about our future in heaven, uh, really, by thinking about heaven, it just will give you joy and, and, and uh, an excitement for the, your future. Uh, okay, let's, let's look at chapter 3. Uh, It says, uh, the first three paragraphs, it says, For every American who believes he's going to hell, there are 120 who believe they're going to heaven. This optimization, um, this optimism, stands in stark contrast to Christ's word in Matthew 7, 13, and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. What would keep us out of heaven is universal. Quote, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. Sin separates us from a relationship with God. That's Isaiah 59.2. God is so holy that he cannot allow sin into his presence. Quote, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong, unquote. Habakkuk 1.13. Because we are sinners, we are not entitled to enter God's presence. We cannot enter heaven as we are. So heaven is not our default destination. No one goes there automatically. Unless our sin problem is resolved, the only place we will go is our true default destination, hell. I remember a street preacher I worked with with years ago. Uh, I don't I don't think this book was even out at that point, but he was always using this term. Hell is the default default, default position. It's like, you know that like on computer language, I, that's where I, where I I think of this term default position, where it automatically goes to it. Your def your default settings. You're you're setting up the all you're doing all your settings on your computer, and the default is it means automatically goes to that. Auto that's automatic. And um, Jeremy was preaching, heaven, uh, hell is your default position. Everybody's going to hell. That needs, that's what needs to be corrected. But Randy is making the point here. Surveys show that, what do you say? 120 to 1 people think they're going to heaven. <laughs> but Jesus said only a few are going to yeah, hell. I'd say those numbers are kind of high. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I, I think this I think this comes from what Jackson mentioned earlier. This is this misconception of heaven. And this comes from a misconception, and I've mentioned this before, and it's funny we're coming into this season because it gives me a chance to use this analogy. I love to use it, but we, we, we demote God to Santa Claus, and people think that God by default is, well, if I'm naughty, I go to hell. If I'm nice, I go to heaven. It's a simple yeah, we'll as have that. To, so, we'll have to be on um, – 
We'll have to anticipate another Jack Smack sermon about Santa Claus, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of. So, I didn't think about that. That's true. Yeah, because you've heard his sermon. <laughs> the sermon is entitled Satan Claus. <laughs> Satan Claus. I've actually used that phrase myself, so. but... But no, it, it's true. We people believe because if you ask them, I love to do the you know, the classic to see what people think. You know, well, do do you think? I ask them, say, why do you deserve to go to heaven? Even as Christians, this, why do you deserve to go to heaven? And the person will say, well, I, I I treat people by the golden rule that Jesus said, you know, treat others the way the way you would want to be treated, and you know, love your brother. And I said, well, you do realize that that's not why you go to heaven, right? I said, if that's your basis for going to heaven, you're not going. And they say, and they get really offended. They say, "What do you mean?" It's like, it's like, well, that's not how you get saved. Uh, saved is not following the golden rule. Saved is not uh, loving your neighbor. Uh, that's not salvation. That's service. You're confusing two different things. And the correct answer to that question is, no one deserves to go to to heaven. No one deserves to go to heaven. Um, yeah. Yeah, Christ I mean, makes you worthy to go to heaven. Um, the 120 people, that's why I think, you know, they kind of fall into that category. Oh, well, I, I'm a good person at heart. And they yeah. think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's no, no, no. It. Like, like I, I met one guy, just to, just to um, illustrate what Eric is saying with a, an ex a real life example. One time I met this guy on campus who, he was telling me, yeah, I'm an agnostic. You know, I'm not sure whether God or the Christian God could be true. But if there is, I mean, I'm a, I try to be a good person, and I hope I'd make it into heaven if there is, or if there is, I hope I will. I mean, that, that just that just really illustrates Eric's point, in my opinion. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we we know that uh, the vast majority of people, he, in, this, in this case, he says 120 to one, uh, or, or only a 100, and, only one out of every 121 believes they're going to hell. So automatically people assume they're going to go to heaven and that is because they think they go to heaven based upon uh, if they're go a good person. And uh, most people see themselves as maybe not perfect or not really good person, but at least they're pretty good. They're good enough to go to heaven. you know. They're, so that's the first fallacy that people need to understand is that the default position is no, we're all sinners. We can't be with God because of our sin. And uh, so uh, until that problem is taken care of, uh, the, the default position is hell. You, you've got to be exiled out of heaven, away from God, because of sin. So uh, uh, here's another point he makes. Here is, he says, uh, judging by what's said at most funerals, you think nearly everyone's going to heaven, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's good because, you know, funerals are a tough one, and I talked to somebody about that. It's funny you mentioned that. I talked to somebody about that recently. You know, I, I tend to keep my mouth shut at funerals. I, I, I leave it to, I'm sorry for your loss, you know, because at heart, I don't know if that person has accepted Christ. I, I, I don't. So for me to say, oh, just, just by default, like you said, the default position, and, you know, use the wrong default position, say, well, they're, just, they're, they're in a better place. Well, yeah, I'm and also lying. It's the Terabithia uh, movie. Ever seen that? Yeah, I I never seen lying. it, but yeah, but I I mean I if I were to say that I'd be lying. Yeah. I mean if if it wasn't true, here I am lying to the bereaved person, uh, which some people would say, well, it's one of those little white lies that you say that's actually a good thing. It's a good lie because you're trying to make them feel better. So it's like, no, guys, there's no such thing as a good lie. There is no good lie. Um, and this is part, of, and this is the compounding problem that happens from a base false notion. It just gets worse as you go, you know. Hmm. I uh, on my Q and A video, someone sent me a, a question with, with basically a letter explaining that his his grandfather just died and that he was asked to speak at the funeral and asked my advice on what he should say and he's, his, his grandfather was saved so uh, I told him what I thought and, and I also told him about uh, my experience with, with funerals and, and uh, I've spoken at quite a few funerals uh, but I don't. So I will not speak at a funeral unless I know the person saved, because then I can speak and I can say I know they're in heaven because this is what they told me. They they expressed their their faith in Jesus as their savior. They understood they they could not go to heaven because uh, of their personal performance. 
because we've all sinned and, and we're all excluded from heaven because of our sin, but they trusted Jesus as their Savior. He died for their sins, and, uh, and that's what their faith was in. So because of that, I know they're in heaven. So by doing that and, and giving a true testimony about of my conversation with the person, it was actually presenting the good news to the audience. So in that case, uh, a funeral can be good, but if if I didn't know that the person was saved, I could and hadn't had that kind of conversation with them, I couldn't stand up and and say that at the funeral, and I would not go down and, and as you said, Eric, I, I couldn't just pretend that everything was okay. I would just have to keep my mouth shut. Yeah, I mean, I don't really see a, a better alternative. I mean, it's it's one of those positions that it's really it's it's no easy position to be in, and it speaks a lot to your faith and that you really true believe in what you say you believe in. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to go ahead to chapter four, and it says, "Can you know you're going to heaven?" And there's a quote by D. L. Moody: "Soon you will read in the newspaper that I am dead." Don't believe it for a moment. I will be more alive than ever before. <laughs> <laughs> and another one of his, on his deathbed, D.L. Moody said, Earth recedes, heaven opens before me. Wow. That's interesting. Uh, I, I had a, a book of quotes, deathbed quotes, of famous people. And uh, the things that they said, the people who were saved, uh, the kind of things they were saying as they were dying were just, just happy, joyful uh, uh, last words. Uh, and, and then the people who were not saved or even famous atheists, it was just like fear and agony. Their last words were just horrible. And uh, so, heaven opens for me was D.L. Moody's last words. Um, this uh, um, this part here, I'm going to read about a page because I made a note that this is a great story. So <laughs> if, I, if I understood it correctly, I think you'll uh, enjoy this. It says, Ruthanna Metzgar, a professional singer, tells a story that illustrates the importance of having our names written in the book. Several years ago, she was asked to sing at the wedding of a very wealthy man. According to the invitation, the reception would be held on the top two floors of Seattle's Columbia Tower, the northwest tallest skyscraper. She and her husband, Roy, were excited about attending. At the reception, waiters in tuxedos offered luscious hors d'oeuvres and exotic beverages. The bride and groom approached a beautiful glass uh, and a brass staircase that led to the top floor. Someone ceremoniously cut a satin ribbon draped across the bottom of the stairs. They announced the wedding feast was about to begin. Bride and groom ascended the stairs, followed by their guests. At the top of the stairs, a maitre d' with a bound book greeted the guests outside the doors. Uh, May I have your name, please, he said. I am Ruth Anna Metzger, and this is my husband, Roy. He searched the M's. I'm not finding it. Uh, would you spell it, please? Ruthanna spelled her name slowly. After searching the book, the maitre d looked up and said, I'm sorry, but your, your name isn't here. There, there must be some mistake, Ruthanna replied. I'm the singer. I sang for this wedding. The gentleman answered, it doesn't matter who you are or what you did. Without your name in the book, you cannot attend the banquet. He motioned to a waiter and said, show these people to the service elevator, please. The Metzgers followed the waiter past beautifully decorated tables laden with shrimp, whole smoked salmon, and magnificent carved ice sculptures. Adjacent to the banquet area, an orchestra was preparing to perform, the musicians all dressed in dazzling white tuxedos. The waiter led Ruthanna and Roy to the service elevator, ushered them in, and pushed G for the parking garage. After locating their car and driving several miles in silence, Roy reached over and put his hand on Ruth Anna's arm. Sweetheart, what happened? She said, when the invitation arrived, I was busy. I never bothered to RSVP. Besides, I was the singer. Surely I would go to the reception without returning the RSVP? Ruth Anna started to weep. 
not only because she had missed the most lavish banquet she'd ever been invited to, but also because she suddenly had a small taste of what it, it will be like someday for people as they stand before Christ and find their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Throughout the ages, countless people have been too busy to respond to Christ's invitation to his wedding banquet. What do you think of that story? I, that's a very powerful story. I loved that story when I read it. Um, it, it, it is, it's exactly what I pictured, and that's why the thought of that, you know, it breaks my heart for people who could so easily accept that and yet turn away from it. And it, it breaks my heart for that moment when they realize they want to be there with the others. They, they want to be partaking in this, and they never can. And it's 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 heartbreaking. It should make you want to uh, to get out there, well, and do what we do here. I mean, it 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 should, it should make more Christians want to get out there and bring the gospel to people. It really should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, Jackson, what do you think? Well, it very much reminds me of a passage in Scripture where I'm trying to remember which where it is. I think it, it's in one of the Synoptic Gospels. I think, but where Jesus is telling a parable of a pastor who invites everyone else over for um, over for a banquet, and all they're, they're all like, oh, I'm too busy, or something like that. I'm too this or that, and they decide not to come, and then he basically, then, then he, he goes and talks about discipleship after that. But it, it's kind of, kind of a passage that kind of puzzled me, because it seemed like at first... It was like a free salvation kind of passage where he's saying, "Come to the banquet; it's free." But then to to do something else, you know, to be a disciple or something, because then the master gets angry or something. We should look at that passage sometime. But yeah, I I'm not sure if that's the same thing as the one I'm thinking about, where they were they came and wanted to get in, but they didn't have the garment on, and and they couldn't weren't allowed in because they didn't have the put on that garment. Yeah, it's and not that, that one. Where yeah. the person thrown into outer darkness? Yeah, I yeah. don't think it's that one. The uh, the like, idea of invitation, though, to me in this story, is a perfect analogy of 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 what everybody has to consider right, if you're watching this video now. And Jesus Christ is uh, giving you an invitation, an invitation to uh, join him at his banquet, his wedding banquet. Uh, the wedding banquet is, is, a, is a term for all the people who put their faith in Jesus. That's called the Bride of Christ. And, and we, we re uh, receive the invitation and we RSVP'd it. So we said, yes, we want to be with Jesus. Uh, we did the RSVP. And then uh, we get to attend the banquet and live with him in heaven for eternity with joy and bliss beyond our imagination. Uh, but in this example, the people, uh, they got the invitation, but they never filled out the invitation, so they were turned away. And so to me, it's just a, really a perfect analogy. And, uh, you know, every time we do one of these shows, we always, at the end, offer an invitation. We invite everybody to receive the uh, eternal life from Jesus Christ. He, it's a free gift. He's offering everyone. So the invitation is always open, but if you do not accept that invitation and receive it, by putting your faith in the Savior, then uh, you can't go to the banquet. You can't get into heaven. Um, it says at the bottom, says, uh, it says, if you have been putting off your response to your RSVP, or if you presume that you can enter heaven without re responding to Christ's invitation, uh, one day you will deeply regret it. Is Randy Alcorn clear on the gospel like we are, by the way? Yeah, we're, 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 gonna, we're in the part now where we're really going to be presenting the gospel from his book, and it's very, very good. There's a couple of little things here that I have to, like, white out, but they're, they're minor. I think overall, we've, uh, Eric and I both read this, and we, we agree that he's really solid at understanding the gift and the grace of God. Great. So, um, okay, now we go to page 33, Eric, in the middle. It says, can we really know in advance we're going, where we're going when we die? The Apostle John, the same one who wrote about the new heavens and new earth, said in one of his letters, quote, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's uh, 1 John 5.13. 
we can know for sure that we have eternal life. We can know for sure that we will go to heaven when we die. Um, a lot of, if you tell some people that you know for sure that you're going to heaven, I mean, some people would, how would they react if they didn't understand uh, Christianity, the message of salvation, uh, and how we actually, what we must do to go to heaven? If they don't understand that, and you tell them that you know for certain you're going to heaven, how do you think they're going to respond to you? Well, any any question of that usually it's it's taken as an insinuation of a slighting on their character. You know, you're questioning their character by even questioning whether they will. It's like, you know, um, that's generally the response that I get. Well, uh, I was thinking if if you stated if Eric stated oh, if I stated that I was going, I'm positive I'm going to heaven. I'm positive. I'm positive. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, oh, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I thought you meant the people who, if when you asked them, no. Um. Oh no. They they oh they think you're smug. They think you're um. Yeah. They they, they think w without asking you. And I, I will always like to include. Well, here's why. You know, because I don't want them to think. Well, I'm saying this because. Oh boy, I've 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 done all the stuff I need to do. I I know I'm going because you know I got you know I I don't want to make it look that way. So I I usually go to the next point and say, it's not. And guess what? You know, it's because of nothing that I've done. I haven't done anything to deserve it. I'm going because it's all on Christ. He did it all. He did all the work from beginning to end. I didn't need to do anything. He doesn't need my help. <laughs> he did all the work, and I trust in that, and that's all I did, and that's all you have to do. And, it, and that's why I think it's so tragic for people when it's so simple. It's, it's yet even faced with the, such a simple thing, they will not accept it. it it's, it's, it's frustrating sometimes. It really is because it's like wait, wait, I'm not asking you to, you know, do a ritual. I'm asking you to cut a chicken's head off and drink anybody's blood. I'm not. I'm not asking you to do anything that's extraordinarily terrible. All I'm asking you to do is trust in Christ. That's all I'm asking you to do. Yet they they just will refuse to do it, and they'll yeah. they'll think if I answer in such a way that I'm confident like that, they think that probably think that I'm smug or arrogant. You know that that's yeah. They don't realize well, the confidence I have is not in me, but it's in Christ. You know, on, on, on one hand, uh, we know the scriptures tell us that we, we have certainty of going to heaven. That's what this verse says, and there's many other verses that we can conclude, that we, we can know that we're going to heaven. We don't have to, like, keep our finger crossed and hope that uh, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, so uh, the interesting thing is, when you said earlier, 120 to 1 believe they are going to go to heaven, uh, and yet, uh, most people tell me that uh, they think they're going to heaven, and they're hoping they're going to heaven, and they, they're, uh, they're hoping they're good enough, they think they're good enough, but they, they kind of keep putting their fingers crossed and, and hoping it all works out. They don't have that certainty, even though they're like, right. like they want to say, yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to go to heaven, and I'm a pretty good person. They don't have that certainty. Mm hmm and, I, and I'm assuming, on, on another note, I'm assuming the one person that thought they were going to hell was okay with that. <laughs> I mean, did the person, have they basically accepted that? <laughs> Just said, oh, yeah, I'm going to hell. No problem. I mean, I'm curious about that one person. I'd really like them to have been a fly on the wall and heard what they had to say. Uh, yeah, just. Well, I've always said, I've always said that any person that ever told me that uh, uh, they wanted to go to hell, and I've had a lot of people tell me that over the years. Yeah, they, they don't want to go to hell. They want to go to hell. Then uh, I tell them, <laughs> you obviously don't really believe in hell. Right. If you, don't you, really if you believe hell. If you <laughs> right. in hell, that was a very bad alternative to heaven. It's a very bad alternative. Then you wouldn't say you wanted to go there. You just don't believe it, it's what what it really is, or you don't uh, believe it exists, or you you know you're just trying to uh, you know uh, be be cocky or something. Because if you really believe that hell was a bad, bad alternative to heaven. You would not be uh, saying that you wanted to go there. Right. So he goes, at the now on page 33, he says, uh, uh, what you need to know and do. Uh, to sin is to fall short of God's holy standards. Sin is what ended Eden's paradise. And all of us, like Adam and Eve, are sinners. You are a sinner. 
That's the first thing you need to know. Sin deceives us and makes us think that wrong is right and right is wrong. Proverbs 14:12. Um, I'm going to read this whole next two pages here, but let's go through it one part at a time. The, uh, the idea that uh, uh, you know, guys know the way of the master. You're familiar with that method? Yes. yes. How they work through the Ten Commandments and. What they want to do is make someone understand and admit that they're a sinner and then that they're because of their sin they're they're lost and they work their way through the Ten Commandments and uh, you know I've used that method in the past but I moved away from it for a number of reasons because I uh, first of all uh, we're not under the Ten Commandments uh, we never have been we're Gentiles uh, the, the Ten Commandments were given to Jews it was part of Judaism and even though the Ten Commandments are, are, are great uh, instructions for us, they're not commandments to us. Uh, and uh, just as the other six, 613 laws of Judaism are not to us. But uh, man does, as under us, another set of laws, uh, Paul called it the law of conscience. And so God tells us what's right and wrong. Uh, but the, the way of the Master, they use the Ten Commandments and say, did you ever do this? Or did you ever lie? Did you ever uh, steal? Did you ever lust after a woman? Did, all, all these things to make people admit that they're sinners. But uh, I found that that's really not necessary. I, I have only found after talking to literally <laughs> over a million people. And I, I know that I've talked to thousands and thousands of people one-on-one -on -one, and more than a million people in audience uh, settings, I very seldom have ever had anybody deny that they've sinned. And that they're, they're, uh, they're, 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 they don't say, that. oh, I've never sinned. Uh, so I found that all that's really necessary is to say, all of us have sinned. Nobody's perfect. And because of sin, we can't be with God. That's a barrier. Uh, how have you found that? Have you, have you encountered the same kind of thing? Because I think it's really, first of all, I don't want I don't want to present the Ten Commandments because then, it, then they could also then conclude that they now once they get saved that they're under the law and they have to follow the commandments as a Christian now. And, and that's what Ray Comfort and the Way of the Master thing teach too. They teach just that. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so we're we're not under the law. Even a Jew that believes in Jesus as their Savior, uh, they're not under the commandments either. The the, the commandments are set aside. Uh, the law of Judaism doesn't apply to us. We're we're saved by the grace of God because of our faith in Jesus as our Savior, and then uh, the Holy Spirit directs us and starts transforming us so that we are. Um, uh, we become a new creature. We're a child of God, and that's a lifelong process of this transforming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the law that Jesus said that we have, He says, can be summed up as love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and love your neighbor. So uh, that's really, He says, if you do that, then you followed all the laws. It'll take care of itself. Yeah, I think your point, uh, your point's well taken. It, it, it's in fact, it's funny you said that because it's the same thing. I kind of used that too and then got away from it. The only way I would use the Ten Commandments now would be in an effort to prove the futility of trying to achieve God's uh, perfect regulation in order to get into heaven. You, know, you, you need perfection. It would be, the purpose would be to show them, look, nobody's capable of never even thinking these things in their whole life. It's, it's just, it's not possible. It's futile to attempt to earn this on your own merit. So right. uh, using it in that way. Even then, you don't have to go through every single commandment. You know, right? Ex slide. Exactly. You exactly. You don't need to go into this big, in-depth, convicting process. You know. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't think you even have to relate it to the Ten Commandments because by doing that, you're you're connecting them to Judaism and legalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you all got to say, look, have you ever done something wrong? Sin is do, just doing something wrong. Jesus says it's even having bad thoughts. You know, have you ever done something where you regret it? You say, I, I shouldn't have done that. I was bad for doing that. Right. Well, you know, and if you need to give an example, come on. You know that you've lied sometimes in your life. You've got lost your temper. You've lost your patience. Right. You've exactly. maybe even hated someone, and that's sin. And that because of that, it's a barrier between you and God. Um, Okay, so uh, page 34 it says, Sin has consequences, but God has provided a solution for our sin. Uh, quote, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans 6.23. 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, loved us so much that he became a man to deliver us from our sin. That's John 3.16. He came to identify with us in our humanity and our weakness, but he did so without being tainted by our sin, self-deception, and moral failings. That's Hebrews uh, chapter 2, chapter 4. Okay, uh, so before I go on, do you have any response to that? those scriptures? I think they're pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're told that God made him... Uh, that's Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians uh, 5.21. This means that even though we are under God's wrath for our sins, Jesus died on the cross as our representative, our substitute. God then poured out his wrath on Christ instead of on us. Christ stood in our place conveyed his righteousness to us so that we are declared innocent of all of our sins and declared righteous so we may enter the very presence of God in heaven and be at home with him there. Well, so far so good on Randy Alcorn's representation of uh, the message of salvation. This is the um, the trading of places. You know, he, he traded places with us. Um, he, he never sinned. And so he's perfectly righteous, and he gives us his righteousness. He covers us, imputes his righteousness to us, so God looks at us as a sinless, righteous person. So now there's no sin barrier. The sin that we have, Jesus took that on himself. He paid the penalty so that we didn't have to pay it. So it's, it's like a trading of places. Uh, he took our place. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, no other prophet or religious figure, only Jesus, the Son of God, is worthy to pay the penalty for our sins demanded by God's holiness. Only when our sins are dealt with in Christ can we enter heaven. We cannot pay our own way. Quote, salvation is found in no one else but Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That's Acts 4.12. And if you've seen any of my street preaching videos, I mean, I've always liked to say, look, look, the Bible says um, Jesus is the only way. There's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. We must call on the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved. That means that Muhammad can't save you, and Buddha can't save you, the Pope can't save you, the Virgin Mary can't save you, and you also must understand you cannot save yourself. You need the Savior. There's only one. It's Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, it says, being himself God and therefore all-powerful, Jesus Christ rose from the grave, defeating sin and conquering death. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, and verses 54 through 57. When Christ died on the cross for us, he said, it is finished. That's John 19.30. The Greek word translated, it is finished, was commonly written across certificates of debt when they were canceled. It meant paid in full. Christ died so that the certificate of debt consisting of all of our sins could once and for all be marked paid in full. Because of Jesus Christ's sacrificial death on the cross, on our behalf, God freely offers us forgiveness. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Mm -hmm. um, Christ offers to everyone the gift of forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. Quote, whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Revelation 22, 17. There's no righteous deed we can do that will earn us a place in heaven. Titus 3, 5. We come to Christ empty-handed. We can take no credit for salvation. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast.
This gift cannot be worked for, earned, or achieved in any sense. It's not dependent on our merit or effort, but solely on Christ's generous and sufficient sacrifice on our behalf. Ultimately, God's greatest gift is himself. We don't just need salvation, we need Jesus, the Savior. It is the person, God, who graciously gives us the place, heaven. Wow. Uh, that's pretty darn good. Uh, pretty darn good presentation of the message of salvation. Uh, do you think anything needed needs to be added to that, or is it uh, uh, is that everything a person needs to know and understand? That's all there is to it. Yeah. I think he was very thorough. Um, and the things that I want someone to know when I'm telling them about, uh, about Jesus, th these are the things, that Jesus is God himself. He became a man. And he said the reason he did it was because uh, he was going to die for our sins. He had to become a man in order to die for our sins. And he had to be a perfect man, otherwise he'd have to be dying for his own sins. So he was sinless man and God. And he died on the cross. Our sins were charged to him, so now we are sin free. Our right, his righteousness is credited to us, and uh, so uh, now we stand before God, uh, where there's no barrier. The sin was a barrier separating man from God. Now there's no barrier. All we've, all we're required to do now is uh, accept the invitation Jesus in, gives to everyone. He's inviting you right now to come to him and receive eternal life. It's as easy as walking through a door, drinking a glass of water, eating a piece of bread. These are the analogies Jesus used to say how easy it is. All you've got to do is believe on him, trust him, put your faith in him, reject yourself, reject your own ability. Understand you're helpless. You can't do it without Jesus. And you can't do it through Muhammad or Moses or anybody else. No one else is able to give you eternal life, just Jesus. So you reject all the prophets of history, reject yourself as, uh, as your own savior. If you're just a good enough person, you can work your way to heaven. Reject all that and instead re realize, admit, and understand that you need to be saved and Jesus is the savior. Once you do that, once you understand that, once you're convinced of that, he gives you eternal life at that moment and he'll, ne he'll never take it away. You're saved forever and ever. So, I mean, understanding about heaven as we're going to be going through this book is, I mean, obviously it's exciting and it's uh, going to be really interesting, uh, but what good would it do someone if they didn't know how to get there? Hey, Austin's here, huh? Austin. Hey, guys, I apologize. I uh, lost track of time today. Uh, yeah, Austin... Uh, I gave you a phone call to remind you of the show, and I told you if you didn't come to the show that you wouldn't be able to go to heaven. Oh, darn. I didn't get a – did you call today, Luke? Because I didn't get anything. <laughs> yeah, I did call you. I, I called you and Jackson at the same time. But I don't know. I, I, I got a recording message. I left a message. So maybe I dialed the wrong number. Yeah, I didn't get – I'm sorry, Luke. I didn't get anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's all right. Uh, so I get you made it here. So I guess you'll get to go to heaven after all. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> what we've done is um, you'll have to go back and watch this. Uh, uh, we, we've still got another fifteen or twenty minutes to go <clears throat> today, but we're working our way through Randy Alcorn's book on heaven, and uh, uh, we just talked. To, Randy Alcorn has a chapter talking about what you have to do to go to heaven, and it was very, very good. So uh, I'm, I'm excited that he understands uh, uh, the gospel, the good news, of, that salvation is a free gift and that we can't earn it, we can't work our way to heaven, we need to be saved, and Jesus is the only Savior. Absolutely, hallelujah to that. So as we're going through this book, I'm reading different parts of the book and then we're just kind of all uh, you know, reacting to what uh, he said in the book. So I'll go on, it says, joining the body of Christ, the church. You may think that you don't deserve forgiveness after all you've done. That's exactly right. No one deserves forgiveness. If we deserved it, we wouldn't need it. <laughs> That's the point of grace. On the cross, Jesus experienced the hell we deserve so that for eternity we can experience the heaven we don't deserve. Wow. 
That's uh, interesting. I, I love the way he phrased those. Uh, all four of those sentences are, mm -hmm. it were just really great writing. Uh, he says, "It uh, if you deserved, if we deserved heaven, we wouldn't need forgiveness." <laughs> yeah. Uh, then he said. Uh, uh, Jesus experienced hell, the hell we deserve, so that for eternity we can experience the heaven we don't deserve. Now, what is that? that that's a picture of two key words that we need to understand in, uh, in Christianity. The hell that we don't deserve, I mean the hell that we do deserve, we don't get. The heaven that we don't deserve, we do get. What are the two words that come to mind that really are kind of those, uh, that defines those words? go with one I uh, mercy mercy yeah, yeah. mercy M mercy no so mercy applies to which part of that statement uh, forgiveness yeah in other words we deserve hell but he gives us mercy correct we don't deserve this we deserve this bad thing but we don't have the bad thing hell we get mercy and then the other thing is we don't deserve this good thing heaven and yet we get it or what word, what word would you call that Grace. The word, I was going to say, yeah, I think in his sentence before that, he kind of sums it up as so the point of grace. the point of yeah. grace. Yeah. That's so the whole point. You don't people, deserve this. He's giving it freely. <laughs> yeah. I've, yes. He really has uh, – it's, it's very well written, and, and it's very, very theologically sound uh, doctrine. Um, but I, I wanted to take this opportunity to, to – I've said this previously, but uh, mercy and grace are not syn synonymous. They're actually complete opposites. They're really antonyms. They mean the opposite of each other. Mercy means uh, you are shown mercy and you do not receive the bad thing. Grace means uh, that you're shown grace and you receive the good thing that you don't really deserve. So they're really opposite concepts. But in, as Christians, we have received mercy and grace. Absolutely. Uh, once forgiven, we can look forward to spending eternity in heaven with Christ and all our, our spiritual family. We need never fear that God will find a skeleton in our closet and say, if I'd known you did that, I wouldn't have let you into heaven. Every sin is covered under the blood of Christ. Moreover, God is all-knowing. He has seen us at our worst and still loves us. No sin is bigger than the Savior. If God wasn't willing to forgive sin on the basis of Christ's sacrifice, heaven would be empty. <laughs> Hallelujah. Absolutely. Amen. I mean, you know, if, to me, I tell people, say, isn't that such a relief? Isn't it such a relief to know that you don't have to get in by your own merit? I am so thankful that I don't have to prove something or say something or go through this list of things where I'm proving my own merit it, it, because I know – I know I'm not deserving of that for the things that I've done. So it's such a relief. I can't understand why people wouldn't want to accept something. that's such a relief when you realize it about yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, – hallelujah uh, is a word I wish I would hear a lot more from people. Uh, we, we should be jumping up and down saying hallelujah all day long. Uh, the, if we are heavenly minded and we're thinking about – these promises from Jesus, uh, and then how could we not be full of joy and happiness and literally jumping for joy and yelling hallelujah throughout the day? I mean, I, I feel that way all the time when I think about these things. And uh, unfortunately, I, I don't see very many people on YouTube with a smile on their face, with joy. Uh, there's, there's just like brows are furrowed, stern, you know, finger, fingers pointing. It's just not what uh, Jason Warner is on the line. Oh, he's on Skype. Okay, he'll probably be joining us. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, Amazing Grace fits this too. The the song. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's that's one thing I told you though, Luke. Back in the day, when uh, the best way to spot, usually the best way to spot a false teacher is by they uh, they're always serious. They don't show any love, any emotion. No. Yeah. They're not yeah. Christ-like. Yeah. 
where they always look angry or they always look like they're ticked about something. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah. Yeah. We, we were talking about that earlier. Some of them play on emotions, though. Well, some I mean, of them definitely play on emotions. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's a time. I mean, I have a couple of videos where I'm expressing a little outrage and indignation, and but but for the most part, it's not not, not called for because uh, most s- s- theological assumptions and discussions are should be like joyful. We should be full of happiness and and uh, hope. Uh, but sometimes, if there's a dispute, someone needs to be uh, corrected or re- rebuked. Uh, then you you can't. Rebuke someone without being stern, uh, but but when I see someone like Yankee Arnold, who I think is is right almost all the time, and that to, for me that's saying a lot because because uh, I, I don't agree with anyone 100 percent, and uh, but I agree with him almost almost 100 percent, and, and but I see this man teaching the, this message of free grace and salvation is a free gift and he makes it so clear but but he's happy when he's teaching and preaching he's happy he's smiling he's joking he's not stern and upset all the time uh, and, con- and condemning and so uh, to me uh, and, you know you can take someone like Joel Osteen and he's very very happy too but the problem with him is that he's He's not presenting salvation. He has 60 minutes on his on his show. 60 minutes, 59 minutes and 40 seconds are dedicated to success and prosperity, and and, and 20 seconds is in, in the end. Uh, believe, uh, put your faith in Jesus and be born again, and uh, make Jesus Lord and Savior. And that's it. 20 seconds. He he gives gives uh, Jesus that a uh, little recognition. So. Um, you know he's he's got a smile on his face, but he doesn't have the message or the emphasis of the free gift of salvation that he should. And then you have some other people that, even though they may have the right message, sometimes they're just like stern and 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 just not. I used to preach with a guy that, even though I loved him very much and he uh, his doctrine was very good, uh, he used to be talking about the free gift and the good news, but had a very stern look, serious. Like and I, I'm, think, I never said anything to him, but you know, I, it never fit. How could you tell someone the joyful message, the good news, without smiling and almost laughing? I get giddy happy when I'm telling someone about it because it's such good news, uh, and you, you want to just yell hallelujah and jump. It. You know, I, I say in Las Vegas, you want to hit the big, the big jackpot and win a million dollars. But what I'm telling you today is better than the biggest jackpot in Las Vegas. This is eternal life and the kingdom of God, and Jesus is offering it freely. It's a gift. Jump for joy. You should be you, the happiest moment of your life to hear this good news. Amen. I didn't, uh, so real fast, Joel Osteen does put the gospel at the end. Not really the gospel, I would say. Uh, he just simply says, you watch his show, he always says exactly the same words. Uh, it's uh, no more than 15 or 20 seconds. He just says, I wouldn't want to end the broadcast without telling everybody to uh, uh, make Jesus Lord and Savior, be, be born again, make Jesus Lord and Savior. Something like that. Well, that's that's kind of tough, okay. Yeah, so that's what he makes. I, I mean, he, he, he gives him lip service for 15 or 20 seconds out of, out of, out of an hour. <laughs> Apparently, Benny Hinn was going to fight him. Did you know that? Physically? <laughs> yeah, but Benny Hinn, there's a video on there where Benny Hinn says, I want to punch Joel Steen in the face, and he's talking about fighting him. And then that's besides his, uh, holy, uh, his Thompson holy machine game vid where he wanted to shoot everybody. <laughs> what? That's funny. Benny Hinn is such a fraud. He's such a fraud. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, uh, he says, if God wasn't willing to forgive sin on the basis of Christ's salvation, heaven would be empty. Uh, I've always, what, what's the difference be, between the people in heaven and hell? The people in heaven are covered by the blood of Christ. Yeah. Of course. The only yeah. difference. Saved, yeah. not saved. They're the same people who didn't deserve it. They're the same people who've done the same wrongs we have. They're... Yeah, but what is the world? If you ask the world in general to say, what's the difference between the people in heaven and hell? And they said, so all the, the people in heaven were, were, were good people? 
and the people in hell right. of them were bad people. We're bad people, right? Yeah. yeah. Some people so, get the impersonation that if they go to hell, they can still do everything and enjoy the company of other people that like to do the things yeah. that Christians don't mm-hmm. like to do. Like, uh, uh, you guys don't like you always don't let us have rock and roll, so we'll go to hell and we'll have rock and roll with all my friends and everything. It's like it's crazy to think that way, but the atheists and the you know just any religion likes to think that yeah the things that's, that's frowned upon here they can do in hell. Yeah, but you know the the, the person that says that they they are going to be having this big party in hell they, they they didn't hear the announcement they missed it that the the party in hell was canceled due to the fire. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is simply that uh, the difference in heaven and hell, the people, the residents, is is not uh, sin. In other words, the people in heaven are sinners. The people in hell are sinners. And they all have the same varieties of sins, and they all have the same degrees and quantities of sin. But the difference is only one thing, and that's faith. The people in heaven put their faith in the Savior. He gave them a, their sins were not charged against them. He gave them eternal life, bliss, joy forever in heaven as a free gift. The people in hell are sinners just like the people in heaven, but they did not RSVP that invitation that was given them. They did not accept it. They rejected the invitation from Jesus to receive eternal life. Uh Jesus said, quote, watch out that no one deceives you, Matthew 24, 4. There are countless groups, religious and secular, that will assure you heaven is your automatic destination or that it can be attained by your hard work and abstention from certain sins. This is false. There is no salvation except by Jesus and his redemptive work. That's excellent. Yeah. So is he also a free gracer, Alcorn? Yeah. Well, you have to conclude that based upon everything he's saying here about salvation that That's we've been covering the last about the last ten minutes. We're in his section, his chapter, where it talks. What do you have to do to go to heaven? Oh, excellent! You see, it goes on to say, false t- teachers can be attractive and persuasive, often quoting the Bible out of context, but they should be rejected because they contradict God's word. Um, uh, Acts seventeen eleven. False doctrine is one reason the Christian life should not and cannot be lived in isolation. We must become part of a family of Christians uh, called a church where God's word is believed and taught. You may feel self-conscious around other Christians because of your past. You shouldn't. A Christ-centered church is not a showcase for saints, but a hospital for sinners. The people you're joining are human, imperfect, and needy. Most church people aren't self-righteous. Those who are should be pitied because they don't understand God's grace. A good church will teach God's word and provide love, help, and support. If you have further questions about Jesus and about heaven, you can find it uh, answers there. If you're looking for such a church, uh, you, one, uh, you add, add, there's an address in the book here. Uh, to the, well, first, let's just discuss that point, that last paragraph there. What do you, what do you think of those points he made? He said, uh, a church is uh, like a, a hospital. He says, a Christ-centered church is not a showcase for saints, but a hospital for sinners. <laughs> Have you ever heard that kind of analogy? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I've heard that exact analogy before. Um, I've heard people say that because, you know, I find in the in the legitimate church groups, the, the um you know, for instance, like our group here, uh, um, one of the things you'll see those people get around, and what they often talk about is what I've mentioned before: things they're wrestling with, things they're having problems with, the things that that have been issues for them in their life, and they're thankful for that God has forgiven them for it. Uh, all the things that they're so thankful for because they're not perfect. Uh, it's usually the ones that aren't very legitimate where people sit around just so impressed with themselves all day long that they can't help but say hey, what wonderful things they've done all day long. Um, I, would, I wouldn't want to be affiliated with somebody like that. I'd, I want to be affiliated with somebody who's being genuine. And the person who comes out and says, hey, look, I wrestle with similar things. You know, Can you help me with this? Pray for me, please. I need it. This is a problem I'm dealing with. This is a sin I'm, I'm struggling with. I, I can much more and would rather relate to a person like that. Um, and that's why – the Bible tells us not to forsake the gathering of ourselves. We shouldn't because we need that family bond. 
Amen. Amen. And whether you, to me, when you talk about that kind of fellowship, um, I conclude that uh, fellowship can only happen on a, on a small scale. Uh, if, if someone's going to a church and let's say there's a thousand people attending, you go there, you listen to the sermon, you sing the songs, and you pray, and, and then you leave, there's no fellowship. There's worship, there's praise, there's learning, but there's no fellowship. Fellowship can only happen in small groups. So if you're in a large congregation, you need to go on Wednesday nights or go through the nights when the men's group meets or the small groups or whatever it is and get to know people, you know, groups of five, ten people, something like that. And that way, uh, that's where real fellowship takes place. And that's where you get to know each other and help and encourage each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, I love this idea of uh, most church people aren't self-righteous. Um, they're... Um, imperfect and needy, but those those who are self-righteous should be pitied because they don't understand God's grace. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of experiences on YouTube. I've dealt with a lot of self-righteous people. And these people, for some reason, they can't look in the mirror and recognize the sin in their life and the, their problems. They, they don't want to even pay any attention to that. All they want to do is inspect everybody else's lives, examine their lives, try to point at their sins, try to point out all their false doctrines and stuff and criticize and to cause division. And uh, that's that's sad. But what do you think, I think the point you make here is very, very important that uh, – we need to be humble, understand that everybody in the body of Christ is is still a sinner. And uh, some people mature much uh, greater than others. Some people are doing it much faster than others. And, and uh, that we should there, be there trying to help each other instead of just criticizing each other and tearing each other down. Real fast, what's the verse with uh, Jesus said about something about the sick? I came from the sick, or the sick came from the doctor. Uh, physician. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so it, right. It's it's not the it's not those who are well who are in need of a physician, but the sick. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, the Jesus Christ came for the sinner, not for the righteous. Yeah. That's and it goes a, it goes along with the point I made just earlier that the uh, look. The people in heaven are not the pe people that quit sinning and became, uh, you know, uh, worked their way to heaven because they were so good. No, they're the people that admitted they're a sinner and they needed the Savior. <laughs> right. And and that extends. And before we get to heaven, between now and the time we take that last breath, we this lifetime now, we need to also keep that in perspective and understand and not become self-righteous and all puffed up and, and judge, judging other people all the time, but mm -hmm. encouraging them. And uh, helping them however we can. Now, now I mean, this real quick again, this this idea that we get together, um, they get together, and you have the self righteous people. It really flies in the face of what we what we really truly are as Christians. Because yeah, you know, I'm I'm an ex military guy, so I like to give a military analogies. But you know, when we become a Christian, we we enter a very real battlefield, and just because we can't see it, um, we can at times feel it, and it is happening all around us. And we become soldiers on a battlefield. And even the greatest of soldiers who, you know, those Christians who have been doing it for a long time, like like you, Luke, you've been doing this for a long time. I've been doing it for, for you know, fairly long time. Um, you know, even the greatest soldiers get hit in battle, you know, and, and get knocked down. You know, our job is to grab our brother and pick him up. You know, and yell at him to keep going. You know, and and, and to pick him up, keep him going. You know, and it doesn't matter. You know how high you, you are up the chain. You know, everybody gets hit every now and then. And that's really when you forsake the gathering of yourselves. You say getting into those small groups, is that was a great thing you said right there. It really is important. You you get involved in these. Well, I'm in such a big church, and I'm in a huge church, and that's you know maybe that's great, but you may not be getting the kind of private attention that you need. You know, in a small group, I, I think I, you can't emphasize enough what what you said. You you really do need to fellowship on a smaller scale where you can really get personal with other believers because that's true fellowship. That's really fellowshipping. Yeah, Amen. I, I, I have a verse for the soldiers of Christ. It reminded okay. me of Second uh, Timothy three three. I'm sorry, I apologize. Second Timothy two three, and it says, "Therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ." Mm -hmm. Writing that down. Yeah. Oh, 
Luke cloned himself again. <laughs> Double Luke. And he had the glasses on again, just like it always happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me... Uh, I, I've never seen my, that happen without the glasses. <laughs> I'm going to unclone myself. Yeah. I knew I was about to make a really good point, too, and I forgot it now. <laughs> Other Luke, for I remember. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I was going to say, we're talking about these small groups. Uh, when I really learned this was probably about uh, 10 years ago. That's when I started a, a home Bible study at my house, and uh, it turned into basically a home church. And, and we had, normally, it would be five people or ten people, and at times we, we had as many as 20 people coming, but it was a s small group where we all really got to know each other, and it was it was such a blessing. I grew more during that time, and that's when I really started to grow, and not only understanding more, but also just feeling that, uh, hey, I'm really, we're really onto the right thing now. I think that's the model uh, that we see in the book of Acts for the, 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 the early churches were home churches, and when a church, a home got a little too big, you know, they'd say someone else would open up their home, and but they didn't say it's, uh, we're getting full. Let's build a big, build a big building. No, they just another small church, another small home church, another small home church. That's the way it was until probably the I think the third or fourth century. And uh, by my, from my experience doing that, that was a great blessing to me. And and now we're able to do the same kind of a thing uh, here on the internet. So if you're not in a small group, really, you will be blessed by doing it. Uh, the final point here I'll make in this uh, tonight is uh, to those who presume they would go to heaven because they were religious, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evildoers. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Those who assume their religious activities alone will get them to heaven have a terrible surprise ahead. Do not merely assume that you are a Christian and are going to heaven. Make the conscious decision to accept Christ's sacrificial death on your behalf when you choose to accept Christ. Uh, you can be certain that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Hey, Devil Luke. Yeah. Get <laughs> glasses. Okay. Uh, let me. Uh, I don't know. Did you get the final uh, of that thing I just read? Yeah, mm -hmm. we got it. Okay, all right, because it looks like it lost you just for like a couple of seconds there. Um, Is your bandwidth high? Do you have your bandwidth high? Uh, no, it's it's pretty low. Uh, and I don't have uh, Skype running. The problem I had before when this was happening, I, we got really bad before, remember, was when the... Uh, Skype was on. In the Skype was running in the background, so let me see. Eject. Eject. No. Okay, all right, so that's that's it for the uh, the book and the study. Uh, let's just make any like uh, final remarks here. I'll kind of sum up a couple of these key points though uh, from because uh, Jackson joined us uh, like 20 or 30 minutes into it and then and then Austin joined us just about 15 or 20 minutes ago. But uh, the, the main things we were just saying is that this subject of heaven is greatly neglected. Very few books written on it, very few sermons preached on it, very few YouTube videos on it. They always want to talk about eschatology or hell or uh, fighting over doctrines, but no one's talking about heaven. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to think about the promises of us, our future, and that's the way that we can have joy and just be just excited about uh, our future. Uh, so 
But most people aren't looking forward to heaven. A lot of people think that it's going to be boring because you're just going to be some spirit thing playing a harp and li listening to sermons all day, and they don't look forward to it. Uh, but I, as we're going through this study, it's going to take us a long time to get through this book, but we're going to find out that there's uh, great thrills and joy in heaven. And we're not just some spirit beings. We're going to have bodies. We're going to actually be living on a new, new created, or newly recreated earth that's perfect. And uh, there's just there are going to be a lot of surprises. The people who are, are not aware of all this are going to be shocked, amazed, and I think very happy to learn what heaven really will be like. But uh, it says we can't really necessarily imagine it, but what we can do is go to learn from scriptures, and the scriptures tells us an awful lot about it. And in this book by Randy Alcorn, uh, all of his conclusions are backed up by scriptures. So, uh, and we know that uh, man's default position is hell because we're all sinners. We don't automatically go to heaven. We automatically go to hell instead. And that's why we all need to be saved. And Jesus is the Savior, the one and only Savior. And all you got to do to be saved from hell and have eternal life in heaven is put your faith completely in Jesus. Do not put your, your faith in yourself. Do not believe that you can get your heaven if you're just a good enough person. Reject that and instead say, I need to be saved. Jesus is the only Savior. Not Muhammad or Buddha or the Pope, just Jesus. Okay? And so that's, uh, that's it. And uh, uh, we'll be going on. But I'm going to give you an idea of some of the things we'll be talking about as we go through this study through the table of contents here. Uh, it's very comprehensive. We're going to be talking about... Uh, uh, the resurrection, or we're going to have a bodily resurrection, and we're going to have glorified physical bodies in eternity. The earth is going to be recreated. Uh, we're going to be ruling on the new earth. Uh, we're going to um, uh, have relationships with, uh, with all the other believers. Uh, will animals be there? Will your pets be in heaven? Uh, what are the activities? What will we be doing throughout eternity? Uh, so all these things and many more, all the questions that you may have been thinking about, about heaven in your life and being curious, and these questions will be answered as we go through this book. And, and I expect if we do two-hour sessions, it's going to probably take us maybe at least ten of them. <laughs> okay? Uh, so let me hear any final remarks from each of the, the panelists, and then we'll say goodnight to the, to the, um, to the viewing audience, and we, then we can talk among ourselves. So uh, how about Brother brother Austin? You go first. Okay, thank you, uh, Brother Luke. Yeah, I can't wait for this uh, study. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, just wanted to leave everybody off, off with uh, actually two verses. Let me go get the second one real fast. And uh, they just remind me of the wonderful gift from Jesus Christ, your wife, faith alone, and Christ song. Uh, one is... John 117, I always read this, but I never took the deeper meaning of it. Today, someone really expressed it, you know, the wonderful meaning of it. And it says, John 117, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to that. And Amen. then uh, what Brother Luke was saying, uh, our default is hell. And as John 336, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So we got to get that wrath away from us. Jesus, take it away from you. It's a free gift. Accept it now. Thank you, Brother Austin. Well said. Brother Eric? Uh, you know, we've talked a lot uh, about a lot of things here, and we have a lot to go because this is it's a long uh, it's a long book. It's a very in depth book, um, but it covers a lot of great things and. It's just going to be, I think, more of a um, uh, an emotional boost, a spiritual boost. The further we go through it, um, we've talked a lot today about um, how we're looking forward to our individual rewards and how we can't wait for our experiences individually. And but you know, you know, the great part about heaven is experiencing this with others. That's going to be part of the greatest part of heaven. Not just experience this ourselves, but to experience it with other people. You know how you read a good book, or you watch a good movie, or you play a game, or something that you really, really like. You can't wait to get out and share it with somebody. You want to talk to somebody about it. That's what heaven's going to be like on a much grander mm -hmm. scale. And that's why you know, when we come to you and ask you with all sincerity, 
please put your faith in Jesus Christ. Um, it is not difficult. Um, it is something that is easy to do. It, you simply have to just realize you are not perfect. You are incapable of being perfect, and that to come into the presence of God, you're required to be perfect. And Christ is the only one who can provide that. And given that, and given what we're talking about here, what we will be talking about, I think if you walk away from this not at least a little bit intrigued by what's being said, uh, I think you I, I think you really need to reevaluate. You need to look at yourself a little better because it, it really presents a really wonderful thing to share with people uh, in eternity. Yeah, that was a, a very great remarks, and and uh, I'm wondering, uh, you know. I, Jackson has uh, Asperger's. Do you, do you also have Asperger's, uh, Eric? No. Well, why is it then you come up with an, an insight that's so interesting, like Jackson does? Because you said something. You said something that is again, uh, I hadn't even thought about, but I think it's a very important thing to consider, and that is that um, being able to share this joy in heaven with other people uh, is a very, very uh, exciting part of this. Uh, and 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 I would expand upon that and just say that to be able to also share that with people that you know here on this world and love your friends and family. Uh, if you haven't told all your friends and family about Jesus and how to get into heaven, then I, I hope this will motivate you to do that so that they can also share this eternal experience in heaven with you. Okay, uh, Brother Jackson. All right, so the other panelists have made clear basically how to get to heaven and everything. So I'm going to make um, my closing comments to Christians, and I would just like to say, because I think, I, I think that many, many Christians don't think about heaven enough, and I would just like to say to, to encourage the, the, the positive aspect of, of heaven and to thinking about it because it's real and it's incredibly joyous and yet all we seem to be able to think about is the other negative side. So I'd really like it if maybe this series could influence people to change that and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good, Jackson. And uh, uh, let me just uh, say to the viewing audience that um, this, this show is uh, called Bible Talk with Brother Luke. It's a uh, live video stream on, uh, stream on Google+. It's every Sunday and Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So uh, I hope you can join us live for all these, these uh, discussions. Uh, as I said, it'll take us quite a few episodes to get through the subject of heaven. Uh, so if you can't watch it live, then you can watch the video uh, uploaded on the uh, YouTube channel Sin City Preacher. So thanks for watching and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.